crab, uh, whether fixed wing or, or rotary or wing. In the United States, first generation shoulder fired anti aircraft missile was the Red Eye. And then a uh, much better known, uh, much more advanced version of uh, the Stinger entered service sometime in the 1970s. Uh, uh, you might recall uh, when the Mujahideen in Afghanistan were fighting the Soviets in the 80s, we finally supplied the Mujahideen with some Stingers, uh, which apparently they didn't all use. Um, um, and so there were issues uh, after the Soviets left, where are the remaining Stingers? But they were very, very effective against the Soviet helicopters. Um, in any event, uh, the, the Soviets... Uh, but we don't have a Stinger here, huh? This is the only shoulder fired any aircraft missile. I've been trying to get a Red Eye or Stinger for years. Yeah, it ought to be one right there. Huh? I agree. I agree. If you have any contacts, I'd I'm love gonna, to follow I'm going to look up. into that. Yeah. No, seriously. <laughs> Yeah, he uh, needs it. <laughs> I've asked all sorts of government agencies, mm. and the answer is uh, we have them, but you can't have them. Mm. I'd love to hear yes, because we really need a U.S. system. In any event, the Soviets developed this uh, in, in the uh, mid-1960s, and apparently, uh, and it depends on what reference work you read, it entered service with the Red Army in about 1968. And it's a very, very simple system, as with many Soviet weapon systems, whether uh, rifles, uh, and I was speaking with somebody here, artillery, uh, shoulder-fired anti-aircraft uh, uh, system. Uh, very simple, very <laughs> reliable, um, and very rugged. And so it came in, in two parts. And, and the upper item is, is the launch tube. And the launch tube was, was made of fiberglass. And what looks like the trigger mechanism, that, that green mechanism hanging down, that's called the grip stop. And that had the electrical system, the trigger, and the safety. And then the battery to power the weapon is this uh, cylindrical object uh, that I'm pointing to now. And the missile was, was built in four sections. You had a, a passive uh, infrared um, uh, uh, sensor in the nose. So it would, it would lock onto the heat of aircraft exhaust. And then the next section was the guidance section. The largest section was the warhead. And then at the end, you had the propulsion section. And as explained to us by an uh, expert from one of our government agencies, although the launch tube and the missile were built at different Soviet facilities, they were all assembled at one facility. And so at this facility where the assembly was done and the packaging and the shipping to wherever they were going, the missile was actually put in the launch tube. And, and then, unfortunately, we only have one of them. Two of these metal and rubber stoppers were, uh, were used to seal up the launch tube. And that's how they were shipped and they were shipped two to a crate. Now, when it came to using them, this, this uh, a very knowledgeable expert that we talked to about a year and a half ago said that um, uh, <clears throat> probably they were usually transported in the crate somewhere near the expected location of use because it kept the dirt off the weapon system, uh, rain, so on and so forth. And so um, um, the, the two tubes with the missiles inside of them would be removed from the crate. And I'm not sure how exactly this worked. I've never seen an account of like 
uh, from uh, North Vietnamese Army personnel or Egyptian Army personnel or Syrian Army personnel or Iraqi Army personnel or uh, any, any one of the uh, armies uh, or uh, fighting groups that have used these uh, over the decades. But they were only, the operator had to be real sure of, of targets in the area uh, before he decided to use it. Because what he did was twist this knob at the end of the battery, and I don't know what the chemicals were in the battery, but as explained to us, there was a membrane between the two chemicals. And when that knob was twisted, the, the two chemicals met, and electric power was generated, but only for one minute. And so the operator one had only one yeah, minute sure. to use the weapon. And so as the operator, let's say, uh, and these were used against our fixed wing and rotary uh, aircraft in Vietnam, what, beginning 1969, 1970, with some success, with some success. Uh, let's Low say flying. Pardon? Low flying. Low flying. Yeah, I'll get to the range of it uh, yeah. uh, in a minute. And so let's say... Uh, uh, the NBA uh, soldier uh, had this, uh, and there were some U.S. helicopters within range. And then uh, he would he would twist that knob, and he had one minute to fire the weapon. After that, there was no power, and the weapon was useless. And so he would point the tube, obviously uh, removing the two stoppers at each end. And the, when, when the power came on, it activated the infrared sensor in the nose. And when that infrared sensor in the nose locked on to a hot target, aircraft exhaust, um, uh, a, a loud noise would emanate from the grip stuff. Now, in addition, the launch tube had two pop-up sights which were somewhat useful to the operator. But most importantly, the infrared sensor had to lock on to the hot exhaust of an aircraft. And then the operator had one minute after, after beginning the power to fire the weapon. And then after that, except for the grip stock, which was reusable, the launch tube uh, uh, was, was discarded. Now the range of these, again, depending on what reference work you consult, it varies a little bit, but apparently the slant range of the SA-7, again, the first generation Soviet system, was about 2.2 miles and reached a maximum altitude of about one mile. Now how weather and things like that affected the missile, I don't know, but I'm sure I mean, think of in, in Vietnam, uh, using this in dry season versus monsoon season. Was there a difference? I don't know. 